take your seat. And if your Bibles are close by, you can crack them open, John chapter 4, as we prepare to continue to worship God through the Word of God as we study. And um, once again, if you're new here, if this is your first time, can you just wave at me real quick? I just want to get, I want to see your face. First time guest, thanks, thanks, thanks for being with us, appreciate it. Anybody else? All over the place, my goodness. Hi guys, good stuff. Uh, second question. You're a first time guest and you love burgers. You love to eat burgers. Raise your hand. You, no, not burger guy? Okay, good. all right, man. First time guest and a burger. Burger lady. All right, KB, you need to do me a favor real quick. Someone blessed me with these gift cards, so I'm just gonna bless you. What's your name, ma'am? Yeah, around the front row right there. Alicia, everybody say, what's up, Alicia? Let's go. Thank you for being with us. Some people accuse us of trying to bribe first-time guests back with a burger. It's not the case. Uh, all it is is a simple token to say God loves you. Uh, we believe God's a big giver, so we're just going to continue to give. Uh, I'm a bacon double cheeseburger guy. I don't know anybody. Ketchup only. Don't like all the pickles. We're my pickle people. Raise your hand if you're a pickle people. There's the exit right out there. Go ahead and bounce right now. I'm messing with you. Well, once again, welcome to our online family, tuning in all around the world. And um, whether you have a burger close by or not, it's going to be a good day. We're my Husker fans, by the way, okay? Man. <laughs> We've been praying for miracles, and miracles have actually happened. <laughs> Nebraska's good again. My goodness. Wow. The joy of the Lord is my strength. No, I'm really stoked for you guys, man. This is great. Iowa State had a bye week, so hey, we didn't win, but we didn't lose. You know what I'm saying? So it's doing good. It's a good week all around. But yeah, we're a simple church. We left Fort Lauderdale almost, golly, 16 and a half years ago to start this church. We started it at a middle school cafe where I grew up eating tater tots and drinking vanilla malts and not wild, and began preaching the word of God in my old middle school and a handful of years later, here we are. And by the way, uh, I think this is week six, I wanna say, for the North Omaha campus is going down. So if you had had a chance, uh, go down and check that campus out. Pray for the, the work that God's doing there too. And online, our online campus is exploding right now, all kinds of people meeting Jesus. And it's really a, a fun season. And so grateful that you guys have joined us. I wanna go to John chapter four. The book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's the fourth account of the life of Christ written by John the Beloved. He was in Jesus' inner circle. And uh, it's funny because he says he's the one that Jesus loved, like, like he didn't love anyone else or something. And he's kind of bragging on it. Yeah, I'm tight with Jesus. Great scripture. I mean, prove, you know, basically the scripture is all about Jesus is God in human flesh. If you look at John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word, in verse 14 of chapter 1, became flesh and dwelt among us. Which is crazy that God took on human skin and lived as a human on this planet. Why? So he could come on the greatest rescue mission of all time that he comes from heaven, takes on human skin, lives the perfect life that you couldn't, that I couldn't, that then dies a death that I should have because I've been off. Anybody been off? I've, I've been off this week. And yet Jesus, God, because he loved us so much, he's like, I don't wanna be separated from my people forever. I'll go ahead and do it. He's crucified and he's buried and three days later, he raises from the dead, proving who he is, man. It's the greatest story. It's the greatest news of all time. And we as Christians have the opportunity and privilege of sharing this truth and trying to reach as many people as we can. And so I've just committed my life to the day I die, man, I'm just gonna preach the truth, not in a weird, pushy, headlocky way, but just with an open hand, man, God, God has yeah, something better for you. And so we're gonna do that today. I'm excited for this message. So 
Let's go ahead and pray one more time. Let's launch, let's see what he wants to speak to us as a church. Pray with me, God, thank you again for this great privilege that we have in this, this auditorium and then the extended auditorium online in the kitchens and cars, country clubs, all over the place, God, you're speaking your word. And so we wanna just do our part that we would decrease, we'd humble ourselves. that you, God, would take your word by your spirit, speak it into souls all over the world and listening right now here in Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you for this church family. We don't wanna back away from anything you wanna do in and through us. So we're leaning in today. We wanna learn, we wanna grow, we wanna be equipped by you that we could break this holy huddle and make a difference in our schools, neighborhoods, gyms, wherever you send us, workplaces. We wanna be on mission for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what is the best investment that you've ever made? The best investment that you've ever made. Some, maybe you invested in Berkshire Hathaway stock when it first came out. And uh, in fact, no, you're not here. You're tuning in online at your private island in Tahiti right now because you made the greatest investment of your life. Or I don't know, maybe you uh, bought 10 houses in 1980 that are now worth 2 million. When you first bought them, they were 200 grand. And so there was this huge ROI. I don't know uh, what you've invested in. Or maybe you invested in yourself via education. I'm a big uh, proponent of getting better every day, learning every day, investing in yourself. And um, I took a course on real estate investment. Speaking of real estate, oh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, and I think I paid 3,700 bucks, and that has paid off in miraculous ways. It's been a blessing. I, I, I believe in it. And, and I would just say, as investor, we all are allotted a certain amount of resource to then double down and maximize and steward well and invest well. And that's all good, and there's nothing wrong with it. However, there's one problem with that type of investment, whether it's money or in your mind. It eventually goes away. The, the stats are in, um, 10 out of 10 humans will eventually die. I don't know if you guys knew that. And uh, then after we die, there'll be an eternity. And one thing I, we make this joke as pastors is you never really see a U-Haul behind a hearse. So you could stack as many chips as you want, but those chips are staying here. Um, I've seen tragically people that were brilliant minds and invested in their education which is great, but then at the end of their life, for whatever, re whatever reason, dementia seeps in, and all of a sudden, the mind that was brilliant now has gone away. And so, yes, we're investing, and yes, let's send it, and let's, man, let's, it's a beautiful thing. Let's do it for the glory of God. Nothing wrong with that. But um, I kind of wanted to come here. I felt just called to be not your financial advisor today, but your spiritual advisor today. Anybody have a financial advisor? They, they just help you kind of with kind of investing in different stocks and no one does? Okay, great. Well, I mean, any event, I, I kind of want to do the spiritual ROI if I could today because that's what we read in our text. Jesus tells this story and he's gonna say, the real investment, if you really wanna see eternal investments, that will, the ROI is eternity, it doesn't just stop, is you invest in, in connecting people with Jesus. Because it's for all eternity. He tells his disciples this, and, and uh, actually last week, it's a continuation of last week's message. Pastor Mike, by the way, let's honor Pastor Mike. Thank you for bringing the word so faithfully, man. Love it. And he shared the story of the Samaritan woman. You remember when Jesus met the Samaritan woman the woman at the well, and he asked her for a drink of water. And she said, you know, and then Jesus, he says, now, when you take a drink of this water, you're gonna get thirsty again. But if you ask me, I'll give you some water and it will never run dry. What was he talking about? He was talking about how humans, all of us, 
have a deep God-shaped hole in our soul and we're thirsty for God. The problem is most of us try to fill that hole with all other kinds of things. And when he meets this woman, the woman was trying to meet the deep need in her soul through relationships. Because Jesus says, hey, uh, you actually had five husbands and the one you're living with right now is not your husband. In other words, you've been trying to get satisfaction through a dude. And by the way, ladies, I'm just gonna tell you, you might be the greatest dude in the world. He ain't ever gonna satisfy. And the lady said, amen. Dude is funky. Man, he, he, he did the whole bait and switch. When I got married to him, I'm like, what is this guy right here? That's what this woman went through. And Jesus was taking this and he was saying, there's something better and I have arrived. <laughs> and she says, well, I, I know there's a Messiah coming and when he comes, he's gonna explain everything to me. And Jesus looks at her and goes, I'm he. Can you imagine, by the way? The first time he ever plainly says, I'm the Messiah, is to a Samaritan woman, which the Jews didn't even have any interaction with any Samaritans. Crazy to think about this. So, what a, don't you just love Jesus, by the way? He's reaching the lost people. It doesn't matter how far you've gone, he's coming for you. So, shares with her, and she is so changed. She's like, this dude is the Messiah. I gotta go back to my hometown. So she leaves her water pot and bounces back to her town, and she's sharing with everybody. By the way, um, the true evangelist is the person who's been so deeply moved by Jesus. It's not the pastor making them. It's like, I can't keep it to myself. So she goes back to the town and <laughs> shares and, and next thing you know, all these people started coming to listen to Jesus for themselves. And Jesus sees them coming, and he has this interaction with the disciples. And if you're a note taker, you can jot it down. Number one, he says, man, people are ripe for the harvest. Write it down, just write down ripe. Everybody say ripe. Not that you're stinky, but you're ready, okay? Like ready, ready to meet Jesus. So verse 35, John chapter 4 Verse 35, Jesus talking to his disciples. They had been gone trying to get some food. <laughs> they come back. This is what he says to them. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. Just ju shove your neighbor real quick. Just say, say, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up, look around. He says, the fields are already ripe for harvest. They're already ripe for harvest. Um, in the New King James, it actually says, look, the field is white for harvest. And Jesus is taking this very natural and practical illustration as a very agrarian society. So he's saying, listen, you've heard it said that when you plant that seed, it's, you know, you gotta water it, you gotta be patient, it's, it's not gonna be till four months when you can actually harvest the crop. He said, you heard that, but I tell you, the actual field is ripe and ready. So what is he saying? He's, he's saying in the natural, you're thinking that they're not ready, but I'm telling you in the spiritual, they are. And he sees all these people coming and a lot of scholars submit those folks that were coming would have white like robes and turbans. And so Jesus is actually pointing out, he's saying it actually, they're ready, man. It's ripe, they're white for harvest. They had already been heard, hearing about Jesus. Now they're coming to have an interaction with Jesus. They are ripe, they are ready. And I was thinking about this as Christians, as people who are deeply changed by the love of Christ, who have been forgiven, free, when we just want to share with other humans around us in our sphere of influence, how do I know that they're ripe? I was studying this, and I was like, I know when an apple is ripe and is ready to be picked. I know when a pear or a peach is, is ripe. How do I know when a person is ripe? You ever asked yourself that? No? Okay, well, I'll give you a couple of pro tips, okay? You ready for one? Number one, jot it down, pain. Pain. What I've experienced as an evangelist or as a Christian wanting to help people, a lot of times when I'm sharing with people, 
when they're ripe, when they're ready, is when they're walking in pain. And I, I don't know about you, but as hu- most humans, when the bank account's good, when the health is good, when the relationships are good, it's not that I don't necessarily believe in God, but I'm like, I don't really need him. I'm good. I'm good. But then all of a sudden, pain happens, loss, tragedy, chaos. What's the first thing I do? God, help me. <laughs> I was thinking about this. Uh, our boys are 22 years old now. Where are my parents at? You'll relate to this. Raise your hand if you're a parent in here. Grand- grandparents, okay. Um, I, sometimes I wish my boys were two again. And the greatest thing in the world is when they'd come and give you a big hug on their own free will. they just come and give you, it's the greatest. We're my parents with two year, two-year-olds right now. Let me just give you a word. Don't be too, like, mad at, like, don't be, like, frustrated. Like, take advantage of this season. I know it's the terrible twos, but embrace them, okay? And our kids were busy kids. They had built-in playmates, and they loved to hang out together. And all I wanted was a big hug, but they were, like, distracted, and they were like, oh, I'm good. I'm gonna go play with my Tonka truck and my toys, and I'm good. And I'd be just sitting there, <laughs> God, I just want a hug. I'm good, Dad, I'm good. Until they all of a sudden ran into like a coffee table or something. And what did they do? Come on, parents, what did they do? They ran to the father or they ran to the mother for an embrace. Ding, 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 ding. Do you know you have people in your sphere of influence right now, they've hit the coffee table. And something has shifted in their, in their life. And they're look, they've been observing your life, by the way. And they're like, there's something different about that person. Maybe they have the answer I'm looking for. They weren't really open before. But now, what? They're ripe. They're ready. Everybody say, they're ready. ready. So, so we, think, we think there's no way they're gonna, that person's going to get saved. There's no way that person is actually gonna listen to me as I want to connect them with Jesus. Can I just tell you, people are really good actors. They, they, they'll have a smile on their face, think I got it all, but you know what what's really happening when people are disconnected from God? If they're really honest, many times they're on their pillow at night wondering what life is all about. And number two, you can jot it down. Here's another thing, um, purpose, purpose. This, this is something, uh, just key indicator, just looking for right people. I would just tell you this. Look for the people that they've been there, done that. They've hit all their goals. Many times they're the most ripe. Why? Because we humans get distracted from our relationship with God by trying to build earthly kingdoms, and then we hit all of our goals, and then we still have that emptiness in our soul, and we're going, what now? Guess what? You have people all around you just like that. What are they? They are ripe. In fact, there's people right here, right now. The only reason you're here is God's trying to reach you and you've tried to have purpose in everything else and now you show up here and you're like, there's something different and it's Jesus and he's trying to reach your soul. That's powerful. Um, the, Jesus says in Luke 10 too, he says the harvest truly is great but the laborers are few. It's not, there's no problem with the, with, with the field. I mean, there's all kinds of people. The problem is with us. And then he says, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I'll ask you this question. Um, what's your field right now? So we have, where are my students at? Okay, I'll, let me just clue you in. Your field is your school right now, your sports team, your club, your activity. That's your field. That's where God has sent you to play in the field right now. Uh, where are my gamefully employed folk up in here, okay? We got, none of you guys work? Okay, good, so <laughs> that means you have a job, you know, like, so you, you might hear, you know, people might ask you, what field of work are you in? Really, what you're really in, you're just, that's where God has assigned you for a season to reach souls, to connect them with Jesus. That's really what it is. That's your field. Sports, I mean, I, you can name it. Um, one of our pastors on our staff, his field is a local gym. And it's so funny because his name is Jim. I just gave it away. His name is Jim, and he goes to the gym, and that's his field. And he's like 85 years old, but he's swole. And he, he rolls up into the gym, and before he opens his car door, before he goes in the gym, he just prays. Jim, before he goes into the gym, just prays. 
And he says, Lord, I know there's a great harvest in this gym. Hurting people, it's a dark and chaotic world right now, and they just need a touch of your love. And so he just goes on assignment. He just goes on mission. Just, just gets the curls for the girls and also open doors for the gospel. That's what he does. And I love it because then he comes and trains our staff how much slackers we are at times. Where there's, there's, it's, it's all over the place. All over the place people are hurting. And what do they really need? They don't need another drink of alcohol. They don't need another drug. They don't need another relationship. What they're really seeking is the peace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ and a relationship with him. That's really what they need. <laughs> and so, so that's your field. That's your field. Speaking of Jim, uh, there was a guy. <laughs> this is awesome, man. This is a, such a cool story. At the gym, and this was years ago. I don't know if it's been 10 years. And our pastor trained us that way, so I would go into a different gym, and I would, I would pray, God, just open up doors. I don't want to be the weirdo Christian trying to headlock people to heaven, but I want to just be authentic what God's done in my life and be a blessing, not a, you know, a, a Bible basher. And I saw this cat. He was a big old swole guy, and he had like a, a hoodie on, and he's, you know, tatted up, and, and you might think, well, that guy's never going to come to Christ. He's, he's mean, this and that. And I just liked him. I liked the guy. He got after it. He didn't play around in the gym. But I would just, you know, just give him a dap. What's up, bro? Love, love your hard work, whatever. Seven years of planting seeds. Seven years. Until pain happened in his life. And in a weak moment, did something dumb. Wife found out about it. He calls me. By the way, just keep on loving on your friends and your family member. You might think that there's no way, but in, when they go through some painful times, they're gonna call you. Yep. Calls me, he said, Pastor, can we meet? I said, when, dude? He's like, now. I was like, let's go. And the dude came over and he sat and his wife came with him. And I just looked him in the eye and I said, man, I'm so sorry that this is happening. But if you both will believe God to do a miracle, I believe he can, he can and will forgive and restore your marriage and change your entire life. Yep. And, and it was so crazy because right when I was speaking to him, I'm like, I don't know how this is gonna happen, but God, you just told me that and I believe it. And within, within weeks, they both come to Christ and then years down the road, he becomes your campus pastor. Yep. <laughs> so you go, oh, there's no way. There's no way for the mean hoodie guy to ever, like, you know, get it right. I'm telling you, like, just like Jesus said, don't, don't say all that, man. It's ripe. It's ripe. People are hurting right now, and you have what they need, forgiveness and peace and the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. We have that. And with the op opportunity to invest eternally, the greatest ROI of all time, Matthew 6, 19 and 20, the Bible says this, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. <laughs> store your treasures in heaven. Come on, heavenly 401k, folks, where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Again, nothing wrong with, hey, be a good steward, invest well, but we're talking about eternal investments. We're talking about ROI, if I had like, I have like an, a Robin Hood app on my phone that tells me how my stocks are doing, imagine you have a heavenly 401k app and it actually says, you know, instead of 100%, negative 20, it just says eternal investment or internal ROI, that's what it says on the app. That's basically what we have the opportunity to do. And uh, one of my favorite books I, I read that really helped me with this is a book by, I think his name's Mark Cahill, and the title of the book is The One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. Think about it for a second, church. What's the one thing you can't do in heaven? Share your faith and lead someone to Christ. They're already there. The one thing you can't do. So we have this great privilege and honor and blessing to see eternal ROI right here, right now, and let me just humbly submit, I truly believe it's the greatest hour for the church of all humankind is right now. I don't know about you, but I've never seen any, anything more dark, more divisive, more chaotic, more distracting ever 
than right now. And listen, in a dark world, let's not like, you know, go hide underground, man. Let's actually bring the salt and light of Jesus Christ to the world. They're ripe, ripe. Number two, return. Let's talk about exactly what is, we've been talking about it, let's talk about it more. What is the actual return? It's not financial increase, it's people. Look at verse 36, John 4, 36. The harvesters, that's you and I, who are able to work as one of God's, I don't know, ambassadors, the harvesters, they're actually paid good wages. How many like good wages out here, right? And the fruit, but check this out, the fruit, or these wages, the fruit they harvest is what? Underline this in your Bible right here. The fruit, the wages, what is it? It's people brought to eternal life. That's so good. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. This text teaches me that the the payday or the fruit is, it's not possessions, it's people. And that is powerful. I was thinking about this and I'm just gonna have a little tangent real quick, I'm sorry. Just pray for your boy Um, in a good way. How many firefighters here at church today? Can you just raise your hand, any firefighters here? Let's give honor to our firefight. We don't have one in here. We got one. Where's he at? Thank you so much. This is, this is great. This is perfect. At the nine, we had one as well. So this is gonna, I'm just going to talk to you the rest, of the rest of the time. But I was thinking about the great privilege of being a firefighter. And uh, for the sake of this illustration, uh, what's your name, ma'am? Let's, let's... Kellyanne? All right, so we're all Kellyanne, Okay. So we're all in class, and imagine you go through a pretty rigorous testing and training and getting ready, okay? So we're like Kellyanne, we're rookie firefighters, and like one of the first assignments we get is like a five alarm fire. Is that what it's called? Like, I mean, real bad. Is that what, I don't know, I'm just, I'm going with it. So, all right, Kellyanne, help me out with this kind of audible. And it's like one of our first assignments, and in the house, upstairs, You find out, the rest of the family's out, but there's a two-year-old trapped in the upper, I mean, it's gonna be almost impossible to get there. But you're like, dude, I'm leaning in, man. Like, I'm about to go save someone. Let's go. God, give me the grace to get after it. And man, there was miraculously a perfect ladder, like the engine kind of, and you went up in there, you broke the window, and you brought that little two-year-old that was, was coughing because of the smoke, and you have the privilege of presenting that two-year-old back to the parents. Can you imagine the feeling of saving? And I'm not sure if that's transpired, but I can't imagine a cooler feeling in the world. Did you know that we as Christians are just like the firefighters? And we have the ability to take the two-year-old by God's grace and bring the two-year-old, present them back to the father, back to the to the Father and say, what a privilege to see this child escape the fires of hell and be able to present it safely back into your arms. Boy, what, a, what an absolute picture of the privilege, the joy people brought to what? Eternal life. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. And again, I like finding deals, closing deals, all that kind of stuff, but it does not even compare to the joy of being a conduit through which people meet Jesus. The Bible says in Proverbs 30 verse, or excuse me, Proverbs 11, jot this down. It's the second half of verse 30. It says, he who wins souls is wise. It's just wise, man. It's wise to make sound investments in people who will be changed for all eternity. Super powerful. And then he does say, he talks about the planter and the harvester Together In verse 37, he says this of chapter four, John chapter four, verse 37 now. One plants and another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. So follow with me. Jesus connects with this woman at the well, He's the one who's planting seeds. She goes and plants more seeds. This huge group of people come back to see if this is really the Jewish Messiah who is the savior of the world. 
And now he's telling his disciples, you get it to enjoy in this harvest as they're all coming to me. Super powerful. So you have someone who plants and someone who gathers in at harvest time. I was praying through this as well, and some of you have been praying for <laughs> loved ones, children, friends, for a long time. And if you're really honest with yourself, you're asking this question, will they ever get to know Jesus? Will they have a chance of going to heaven one day? And if you're really honest with yourself, you've been kind of like, man, I, I, I don't know. Here's what I would, here's what I would encourage you. Um, keep on planting seeds. Keep on praying. Keep on loving unconditionally. Keep on serving practically. The way I picture this is like little ticking time bombs. You just picture there's this huge wall between them and God, and they're, they're just blind. They're not bad people. They just have, they don't see the truth. Your prayers and your love, they're like little ticking time bombs on this huge wall. Tick, 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 tick. And at just the right time, God the Holy Spirit hits the detonation button. <laughs> and that wall comes down and their eyes are open and they come to Christ right in God's timing. He's always on time. Sorry, can't sing. This just happened, man. Um, that's the beauty of, you don't know if you're planting, watering, reaping, like, we're just participating in what God wants to do. This happened, there was a, one, of my, one of my good friends, <laughs> talk about a wall. Uh, us guys, man, we are stubborn, aren't we? Especially dudes, where, where are my dudes at? You're just, oh, just stubborn, thick. We're just thick-headed. Oh, I'll just white-knuckle it harder, and I'll just get through life. And it's like, ah. Just take your hands off the wheel, hop in the back, let Jesus drive, bro. But even, we're thick. And this was one of my homies and totally thick. And, but the beauty is people praying, his wife, I don't know how she, for years praying, praying. Tick, 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 tick. Years, decades. And right at the right time, this was a couple of years ago, I'll never forget, right here in this building, he comes at the end of the service and he looks at me straight in the eye, he's weeping, he says, I'm all in. And that dude and his family and the generations will be eternally changed. And you talk about eternal ROI. <laughs> Not all the money in the world can give me the joy that I had that day seeing this man in God's perfect timing come to know who he truly is and have his eyes open. And I see the fruit in his life as he helps other people now as well. It's the beautiful snowball effect of Christianity. Paul was writing to the church in Corinth and he expounded on this idea that I wanted to be able to present to you because at this point, some of you in here are feeling pressure by the pastor to make sure you're planting seeds and you're bringing people to Christ all the time. Let me just, let me just tell you, we don't convert anybody. We don't, it, all we're doing is participating in his beautiful work. It's God in his timing, but we all have a part to play. And Paul's writing to the church in Corinth and they're kind of a little off a little bit. He's correcting some stuff. And here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse five. Jot it down, go study this. This is a really good text. He says, after all, because what was happening in the church, they were talking about how like, they liked certain pastors better than others. So he says, hey man, after all, who's Apollos? That was one of the pastors there. Who's Paul? He's another one of those dudes. We're only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. You see that? Each of us did the work the Lord gave us, just obedient to what that is. Paul said, I planted the seed in your hearts, and then Apollos, he watered it. He, he helped it grow a little bit. But check it out. Who's he giving glory to? But it was who, church? It was God who made it grow. Now, pause right there real quick. Just take a big exhale. It's God who lets it grow. We don't, you don't headlock someone into growing. We plant seeds, we water. It's God that does the work. He's the one who makes the seed grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is God makes the seed grow. I love it. Verse eight, 
the one who plants and the one who waters, that we work together with the same purpose. And both will be rewarded. There's the ROI for their own hard work. We're both God's workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. I love that. So we all have our part to play. Some are planting seeds, some are watering. And then, you know what? Maybe, maybe even this, at this worship encounter right now, maybe you've been praying, you've been planting seeds, and for whatever reason, in this season, it's been 10 years of your friend hearing this, and for whatever reason today, the ticking time, the detonation goes off, and at the end of this encounter, when we give an opportunity to say yes to Christ, it's their day. It's very well it could happen <laughs> within the next 10 minutes. It's super powerful. So he says, hey, listen, don't say it's four months. People are ripe right now. Number two, the return is people for eternal life. And finally, number three, jot down the word revelation. Revelation, I love this. Verse 39 now, John chapter four, verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus. Check this out. I don't know if you, know, if you noticed this when you read this. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I did. Remember when he was like just reading her mail and saying that? And Mike said it earlier, I love it. You can argue the Bible, you can't argue a changed life. Is it Jack? Where's, where's my man Jack? Like, I love hearing his story. He talked about struggling with, with uh, drugs, with pornography, sex outside of marriage. Dude, I'm right with you, bro. Like, I, I was living that, trying to fulfill this God-shaped hole in my soul, trying to find that. And you know what? Sin's pleasurable for a season, but then all of a sudden, then, then what? That's a good question, then what? And by God's grace, in my truck, in the middle of a snowstorm, just like you, bro, came to Christ, and now have deep peace in my heart. But what, what was it? It was the woman's testimony that allowed these, this group of people to believe. And that's why I, I love personal evangelism. It's personal testimony. Share your story. There was an um, evangelistic group called Evangelism Explosion back in, I think it was the 80s. And do uh, you remember that one with D. James Kennedy? And they came out with this study. And it was so profound. They said, if, if you had this huge like, um, church service, with 50,000 people in an auditorium every single night for 35 years and every night 1,000 people of the 50,000 said yes to Jesus Christ. After 35 years, you would actually be behind your goal of world evangelism because of the exponential rate of birth. So you'd be behind 35 years later if every single night 1,000 people came to Christ. But then they said, we got a game plan. And then they said this, if the whole earth, there was not one Christian on the entire planet, but you came to Christ and you shared your testimony and your faith and your friend came to Christ, just one, once a year, at the end of that first year on the planet, there would be only how many Christians in the entire planet? Two. Two. If those two people shared their personal testimony with one other person the following year, there'd be how many Christians on the planet? In year three, they did the same thing. How many would be at the end of the year? You guys are math majors. This is great. And then each one of those people, one time per year, shared their faith and introduced your friend to Christ. Once a year, by the end of 35 years, the entire planet would come to Christ. Now let that settle in, church. It's not Mike, the professional pastor that's leading people to Christ. Now he's great and I love listening to him, but I'm gonna tell you, y'all have a story. Y'all have a past. No, man, I was perfect. No, y'all have a past. And what do we have the honor and privilege of of sharing what Christ has done? I, this just happened to me. Just this week, I was invited into this opportunity to share with some folks. And it was just, I, I'm, I came home just like giddy with my wife. I was like, guess what I got to do today? It's the greatest. Some amazing people and just got to share. So many people think that God's this big ogre in the sky trying to whack them. It's the opposite. He came to love you. In fact, he whacked himself so he wouldn't have to whack you. 
Okay, all right, everybody, let's just get back in here. Okay, so the power of personal testimony. So, so the woman goes to this area. She, t- she shares her personal testimony. These people are starting to believe, but the next level of revelation, and you gotta catch this, and this is where we'll land the plane, verse 40. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days. Thanks, Jesus. Long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. But here, here's the key verse. This is what I wanna, I wanna leave you with. This is so profound. Verse 42, I don't know if you saw it. Then they said to the woman, listen, now we believe not just because of what you told us, that was cool, but because we have heard him ourselves. Underline that in your Bible. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Oh, I love that powerful lady that you said that, but now I've been hanging out with Jesus. I've been hearing his word. That's why we're weirdos about being a self-feeder at this church. Because man, I might see Jason and he shares his story and I come to Christ. It's a whole nother thing to continue to hear from Jesus in his word every day. And now my faith is fueled up. It's powerful. I, I love my parents. I got a great model of loving God growing up. But there had to come a day when I had my personal revelation of who Jesus was. I can't just be riding the coattails of my parents' faith. There comes a time when I say, I'm I'm in, I'm in. To wrap this this text, um, I'll tell you the story and I promise you, we'll release you to brunch, go eat some eggs and bacon, French toast, catch up on some Husker highlights, those of you that missed the game. Uh, before we do, let me just land with this because this, this really connected with this text well. So this week, um, I got a fade. It's not a fade, it's a haircut, just so you know, from this guy. And I sat in his chair and I was like, man, can you just tell me some of your story? And the cliff notes is he grew up, dad was incarcerated, mom was addicted to a lot of different stuff, drugs and whatnot. And he had to grow up early at age 12. He became the man of the house, had younger siblings, went and played pro or college football. And it was a grind. It was a tough, I mean, character forming and growing. And we just had a lot of relatability with each other. And he, he said, though, it, it, at the, his last season, he ended up quitting. And to make ends meet and to help some of his family members out, he went and got a job at Walmart in his college town. And there was a couple that drove 30 minutes from a different state to work at Walmart, like an older couple. And he told the story about how they just embraced him as one of their own. And I started thinking, that couple wasn't going to Walmart for a job. They were going to Walmart on a mission. They knew this text that the harvest was ripe and that dude right there was, was ripe. And over time, they just loved him. They, they took him in, they fed him, took care of him, didn't judge him. He was still far away from God. But he said, and he said, this is so cool. I said, well, dude, how did you finally come to Christ? He said, he said that whole time they didn't judge me. He said, I never understood the grace of God until I observed their life. So it's their testimony that kind of opened up the door for him, but that eventually, and this couple was very good. They shared Christ. And then they said, but my man, you got to make your own decision on what you're going to do with this, this information. And in just the right time, what did he do? He bent his knee and he said, Jesus, I'm done trying to do my own thing. I'm all in. Will you forgive me? He placed his faith in Christ. And I'm telling you, man, this dude has a thriving business. Dude is married. They just found out they're expectant of their first child. And you talk about a generational change that's gonna change the world. That's what it's all about. <laughs> he observed it. Well, it's so powerful because you, you think your neighborhood or your job, school, club, ah, they're never going to get it. I don't relate to them. They're too far. No one's too far from God. Sorry. It's ripe. It's our great opportunity. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Lord, for this word. So solid, so challenging, encouraging for us. And Lord, I just pray for the church, not out of pressure to perform, 
to see people introduced to you, but a privilege to be led by your spirit, to love people unconditionally, to share truth. So much whack, non-truth in our world. So I pray that we would just humbly and courageously present you to many, many people that are lost right now. Good people just disconnected from you. We pray for a reconnection to the creator through Jesus. Again, all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.